Welcome to episode 39 of the Sports Geek Podcast. On this week's podcast, we chat with Chris Gross from Fox Sports Australia about social and digital. And we have a chat with pricing expert, John Manning. Welcome to the Sports Geek Podcast, the podcast built for the sports digital marketer. And now, here's your host, who claims sneakers on his tax return, Sean Callanan. Thanks, DJ Joel. My name is Sean Callanan from Sports Geek, and you're listening to the Sports Geek Podcast. Um, if anyone from the Australian Tax Office is listening and is wondering why my sneakers are on the tax return, they're all part of the Sports Geek brand strategy, the custom Sports Geek Adidas shoes, uh, my signature. And so they obviously need to be and remain on my tax, rec- tax return to be claimed. Uh, thanks very much for joining me for the Sports Geek podcast this week. Uh, thanks to Anthony uh, and Bart, who actually sent an email from Ireland and Amsterdam saying they've been listening and enjoying the show. So thank you very much, guys. Uh, on this week's show, I had a chat with Chris Gross, who is formerly uh, was with Vodafone, a telco here in Australia, and is now heading up Fox Sports Australia's social and digital initiatives. Um, so a real change in direction from a customer service focused telco to a you know a content beast that is Fox Sports Australia. So we have a chat about digital initiatives, what they're looking to do, um, and how they tackle social at Fox Sports. And then later on in the show, um, primarily off the back of a Beers Blokes Business podcast, we had John Manning on as a guest bloke. Uh, he is a pricing expert from Pricing Profits, so I thought I'd invite him on to have a chat about the world of pricing and how it applies in the world of sports around ticketing um, and packaging and those kind of things and the different kinds of pricing models that are around. So hope you enjoy that chat. And then also later in the show, we've launched the Sports Geek One Day Educational. Uh, it'll be on at March 31st at Honey Bar, but we'll have more about that uh, later in the show. But first up is my discussion with Chris Gross from Fox Sports Australia. Very happy to welcome from Fox Sports Australia, Chris Gross, who's the head of social media and digital marketing at Fox Sports Australia. Welcome to the podcast, Chris. Cheers, Sean. So, Chris, you know, you're now, like I just said, head of social media and digital marketing, but previously uh, you got started in social and digital at Vodafone. Do you want to give us a bit of background of your, I guess, your journey to, to where you are now and what you sort of learned from the Vodafone experience? Yeah, sure, Sean. Um, I was I was actually at a digital agency for a couple of years, and then I made the the switch over to Vodafone. My background prior to that was in mobile and social, which I was kind of really really keen on in around '07, and went across into Vodafone in '08 uh, and did some work in in mobile advertising. And after kind of a, a year of that, uh, the role kind of opened up full time within social, and I was absolutely dying to get back into that full time. So I started at Vodafone and kind of working full time in, in social in 2009. Um, and, you know, we were really looking at trying to define, I guess, at the start what, what we were trying to achieve from it. It's, it at, that, at that time, I think it was a lot of people kind of looking around, kind of trying to figure out, we know it's important, but what are we going to do with it? Uh, so for us, that was really about setting the foundations. For us, that was care first and foremost. You know, as a social brand, you can't really... Uh, you can't have a conversation with people if you can't help them first, and particularly with a brand like Vodafone that was customer care oriented, uh, that was really important as a base foundation. The next part for us for that was brand, and that's really around how you know how we're increasing reach uh, and engagement with people. Uh, and then the last bit of that journey for us was within sales. So, okay, there's lots of conversations going on in the open web about about telcos and phones and things like that and it was how do we uh how do we leverage those that, that, that can ultimately make the uh the business some money and so i mean that you know being working for a telco it's obviously like you just said very customer service focused and then moving to the sales so what was the what was the adjustment like for you coming from you know that that experience uh to now fox sports australia and really being a you know content house of you know having all this content that you've got at your fingertips Absolutely. Um, look, it, it was great for me. You know, first things first was I didn't actually have to hide or minimize the uh, the, the, the sports screens that I would inevitably have uh, up on my computer or 
in the top right corner showing the highlight reel. So I didn't have to kind of hide those away. I could be watching those in full screen happily. So that made a good difference into into my life uh, from day one. Uh, ultimately, between these businesses and regardless within a digital or, or, or social framework, I see it always as balancing really content, process and people uh, and technology as well. Content is the absolute heart of it. We all know that. But the process, people uh, and technology is really important. At Vodafone, technology-wise, it was you know it was very strong. We had a lot of stuff there, and 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 the people and process piece of it, of, of it was as well. Um, in that regard, you know, by the time I left Vodafone, we were talking a team of around 35 that were working full time within uh, within social media, uh, and then coming across into into Fox Sports. You know, we didn't necessarily have the technology infrastructures of a Vodafone. Uh, however, we were content very heavy. Uh, we didn't have the obviously the the size of the resources either. Uh, though again, um, though again, you know, it, it was something that we were looking to build out. So. Being being Fox Sports, having all the content, it was really about how do we unlock this and how do we make this more social. Uh, it, it, it began around how do we start to teach the business how to how to do social better. You know, I wish I was an expert in every sport. You know, I'd like to consider that I've got you know a fair a fair uh, opinion on a fair few of the sports, but I'm certainly not an expert in all the sports. No one can be and no one can be that within social media so really what it was about for us was starting to take the experts within the different sports whether that be the editorial resources or whether that be the producers who are creating the broadcasts and even sometimes you know the guys in stats who are who are sitting there and coming up with some of these insights and really interesting pieces how do we teach them social how do we connect them to the right different micro communities for those sports uh, how do they ultimately end up interacting more and cr- producing more content that is social at heart that we know is going to work in that space? And that was a that was a really interesting uh, a difference in between uh, Vodafone and, and Fox Sports, and it's been a good challenge to kind of taken up over the last eighteen months. And so, from a from a Fox Sports point of view, in your in your role, what what's your main drivers? Are you trying to get more people to, to, to sign up to subscriptions, to, to, to be watching Fox Sports uh, programs, to be consuming content. I know it's a bit of everything, but what is your, what is your main driver is what you're trying to do from a digital and social point of view? Yeah, that, that is an interesting one. Whenever you ask someone uh, that question, they kind of always say, you know, oh, all of the above, please. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. But, yeah, but but we never know it's that simple. Look, we, we've kind of got three major outputs of how, how we're looking of what social media will, uh, will, will move the, the dial on. From an editorial perspective, you know, we are we're a big editorial machine within here, and ultimately, what that means is uh, is traffic. You know, we monetize our our properties within foxsports.com.au, uh, and we want to get more and more people there. So, from an editorial standpoint, it's about referral traffic from social media, and it's about how we maximize that. Uh, the other part for that is so that's one of them. The other part for us is that we are a broadcaster, so it's about how do we bring what's going on within social media into the broadcast to make that a more compelling product and you know more engaging to our viewers that can be a challenge in terms of how we measure that we start to look at numbers around increasing share of voice for the program and interactivity but that's definitely a part that we're looking at uh, as well and the third part for us is a marketing aspect so that's about how we are increasing engagement and particularly reach of fox sports and again a big one there is share of voice of conversation over sport so before you were talking about um you know the technology what's some of the what's some of the technology that you're using there to to one measure those kind of things but what are some of the tools that you guys are using we've got a few uh bits and pieces we've um we've just migrated over and are just ramping up on a tracking measuring and publishing tool called spreadfast uh which is out of the states uh we kind of we really like that aspect of it because it's it, it works to our model well of uh, you know unlimited seats and being able to ramp up and focus on publishing and content calendars and but being still giving us flexibility to be uh, uh, you know move these things around um, as you know you know in the sporting world Sean you know if, if only five or ten things throw your your, your day kind of sideways. Um, in any given 24-hour period, it's probably a slow amount. So we need to, you know, we need to be quite agile in that regard, and we're happy with that tool giving it to us. 
Uh, likewise, the, the tracking and measuring numbers in there are good. We all, we'll also work with natively, well, I shouldn't say natively, we'll work with, with the platforms themselves, particularly Twitter, uh, given that it's live TV. Uh, and that's really where we're seeing the percentage of conversation being in. So we'll work with those guys to, to understand how we can unlock some, some more of the numbers that, that, that they see. Uh, we're also in the process at the moment of launching our own forum, which should hopefully be live in, uh, in during March, uh, which will be a fantastic piece. That's powered by Lithium Technologies, and we're really excited that to really build something that's going to be the, the home of conversation on, on sport in Australia. So it almost is effectively a little bit uh, old school, like the old is new again, the bulletin boards where a lot of the, the chatter sort of had what was happening before social media, but, but now social is getting so noisy, and if you really want to dive into... A conversation on Super Rugby or, or uh, you know, the A League. You want it to hap- You want that conversation to be happening back at Fox Sports. Yeah, absolutely. We 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 would like that. Ideally, look, the consumers are empowered. They can have that conversation where they choose to. The other thing is, it's what type of consumers are we looking for within Facebook? It's you know, we're trying to create very frictionless positive experiences where someone can get a bit of information very quickly within a value exchange. They can go check out an article. You know, they can vote on who the top player was on the weekend. Where we are then looking within our experience that someone wants to have a deeper experience, more of a robust conversation, whether that be with our editorial teams or maybe with some of our presenters, um, or whether it is just with like-minded, passionate sporting fans who are knowledgeable we see that as a, as, as a logical place as being somewhere within the forums and so in the same way that uh, uh, sports teams we talk about uh, sports teams developing their their fan base and sort of taking along that digital journey and using social to sort of accelerate that and you know at the end point there's the there's the the member or the season ticket holder is people in the states we call them that you know hands over their credit card and they just keep renewing every year you would have those same sort of you would have that same sort of customer escalator from a from a Fox Sports fan point of view. Is there particular you know do you do you target these specific products or particular platforms at those kind of fans to say we want these you know those super avid fans that are talking all the time about that sport? They're the guys that are going to be in our forum, whereas the, the casual fan that's just watching um, you know the the the, sh- the nines or whatever it might be on at that time. Um, they're just going to we want to take them and try to move them along that chain to become more avid and more involved with what you guys are doing definitely look you know we talk if we can be you know people who just generally follow sport if we can make them you know more of a fan of a sport or a club and and from there you know they start to really get into it and they then become kind of you know a fanatic about that sport or that club but that's you know that's a great thing and they will be having those deeper experiences so yeah we're definitely looking at shifting people along uh through that where possible uh and and the interesting thing i think from from a fox sports perspective as well is that you know that's going to happen at a myriad of uh, or a myriad of levels i guess across different sports so you know someone can be an absolute fanatic on football and you know they're 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 sitting there uh, in the stands of uh western sydney wanderers every weekend but how does that translate then to one of the traditional winter codes or is that person just into football and hopefully we can give them kind of those experiences and different experiences across the different sports and i guess that's the other that's the other component that uh, you've also got you've got this umbrella brand that is fox sports australia but then you've got these i guess micro or sport based uh, brands, you want to sort of like what kind of platforms are you are you on, and and sort of having that strategy of we are going to dive down and do specific stuff for the football community or for the AFL community or for the NRL community. Yeah, so we're across uh, within Facebook. We have, we have kind of Fox Sports Oz as a as an umbrella brand uh, that covers all sports. We then have our our core sports have their own Facebook pages as well. That is. Uh, Fox Footy, Fox NRL, Fox Rugby, Fox Cricket, Fox Football. Uh, we then have Fuel, which is our racing channel, and we also have uh, sorry Fuel, which is our surfing and extreme channel. Uh, some uh, some of the MMA stuff within there as well, uh, and then we also have uh, Speed, which is which is our racing channel. Within Twitter, for those environments, we have again a very similar format across um, Umbrella Brand, and then we have I guess the core sports within it. We also have for all of those sports a shadow account, which is the live account. Now really what the live account is, and this is where 
where it, it differs slightly in between Facebook and Twitter for us, is our live account is really looking at the fanatics. So that is a huge volume of content that comes across it. And, you know, that is all the news articles that is coming through it within a day about that sport. That is live live games uh, on the weekends. It's live during the, uh, during the magazine shows or the entertainment shows during the week. Uh, it's live chats with players when they come in. It's a large volume. It was really quite interesting when we started. We were thinking, well, is it is it too much to have two uh, two accounts per sport within within Twitter? You know, will there be some cannibalisation in there? Are people just going to get annoyed with it? And we actually, you know, we did a test by essentially, you know, uh, going dormant on one and starting to use it as a as a as a go between in between the ways they were both used previously. And you know, we saw that the numbers were badly affected from it. They are two separate audiences within there, and that's the the strategy which we've kind of pushed forward uh, going going ahead. So when you've got, like you were just saying, then when you've got all of these platforms, I know you've you know you've done the work to skill up your editorial staff to help manage uh, these platforms, and especially in those smaller sports. But how do you know you're using tools like Spreadfast to try to push out as much content as possible? But what's what's your resourcing sort of situation look like to manage all of these different properties? Uh, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, look, we've got a big footprint. Uh, you know, it's 30 plus odd accounts with a forum about to launch and with our personalities that, that, that we help on within here, that's about another, you know, 40 accounts within there. Uh, so the resourcing's pretty slim. You know, I was talking about Vodafone days. I had a team of 35 in total full time on social media. I really kind of talk that's what i what we were doing there was more around building a social brand uh and ultimately you know that's around resources that are largely siloed from the rest of the organization uh working away in what they're doing but they're not necessarily connected into being able to affect change within the product or service that they are working on um and they're they're, they're largely trying to push marketing type of metrics within what we're doing here we're definitely trying to go down the social business route which is more about teaching people so the so we have a very kind of uh we have a pretty agile and small team that works on that um within that that includes a social media manager um the role of social media manager is really just to go around and teach the business how to do things better it's about that person is setting a frameworks and and content uh, themes that can then work across different sports and then having the editorial people and the broadcast people who are able to pick those up and run with those and then they can evolve it. Yeah, so you're, um, you're just trying to extend the skill set of your editorial and, and TV production people so they – because it does, it, the, the content that comes from their point of view and directly from their room is, is far better than having someone just keeping an eye on what's happening and trying to report on it. It's much better, you know, coming from that – that team themselves absolutely and you know when we're trying to cover you know dozens of sports uh at any given time that's going on around the world there's no way that we're going to be able to do that through one single person so so that person's role is you know is about make everyone else better it's uh it's not necessarily a tangible output if you will from that person it is a how are you moving how are you helping everyone so together we're getting better and we're really seeing a big improvement across across all the accounts and so, if your LinkedIn is correct, you are looking for another social media manager. Guilty, yes, we are. Uh, we are looking for a social media manager at the moment. Uh, we've lost our, our faithful uh, buckle up, uh, Luke Buckle. Um, is heading into into the startup land, so we are looking for a social media manager at the moment um, to go sit alongside the community manager that we've got in there that will be running the forum and and our CRM manager. And so, uh, and so that I mean that becomes. Like the question that we sort of had and the discussion we had before we started the convo is is where do you find that people because you're in a similar spot in, in with a lot of sports teams you know there'll be people like you and me hey I'm a big sports fan I'm a geek I love Twitter oh I can do that so it makes it very hard for you to one find the right person to to, to fit that role is there any particular way that you've done in the past couple of years, both at Vodafone and and now at uh, at Fox, on how you can best find the right person for the role. Yeah, look, it, it, it is a challenge. I know I'm not going to get someone who 
can tick the boxes in their experience of everything that I'm after. You know, we're looking at someone who's worked within broadcast in shows and how they integrate social media into that, including the technology that delivers that through this integration, which is complex pieces yep. through to someone who has worked within social media specifically within channels like Facebook and Twitter setting content uh, but also you know measuring the output of those um, you know through to someone who's worked with editorial teams and you know some of the opportunities that, that come with that as well as challenges uh, to steer those guys on what best practice is uh, as well as taking care of marketing aspects of campaigns that come through. So it's a huge variety within this role. So I know, you know, sadly, I'm not going to get someone that's going to be able to tick all those boxes. Really what, what I hope to do and or, or what we've done traditionally and how I'll approach it this time is that we're really looking at someone that can tick a, a fair chunk of those boxes uh, and, then, and then we're hiring off capabilities, how we kind of go through that. Um, and, and obviously a cultural fit as well is a big part for us. How, how essentially we go through that is that, Generally, the process involves we sit down uh, with those people, we have a bit of chat, see if we're on, on the same page length, and we end up you know, sitting in front of a whiteboard for about an, half an hour, and we start to kind of draw and plot different things and really unpack how that person's brain works. I think once you have those capabilities and the right way of thinking, and, and, and it's important to mention here, the right way of thinking isn't necessarily the same way that I think or the same way that someone else in my team thinks. You know, we like to sit here and, you know, argue things out and, you know, disagree because we get to a better solution. Uh, so getting someone who can bring something to the table in that regard, uh, then, you know, that that's really what we're looking for. And for us, you know, that's not about necessarily rushing the person here. Don't get me wrong. I would love the ultimate candidates to be starting tomorrow. That would take a lot of stress off my life. But, uh, yep. you know, we will wait for the right person to come along. And we've done that in the last few roles and uh, and we're definitely reaping the benefits of it now. And, def- I mean, I think one thing um, that you, you've got to be mindful of and especially, if you, you know, if you're applying for the role and Chris's uh, details for LinkedIn and Twitter will be in the show notes for this podcast – is that there is a difference between just being a sports fan and then jumping into working in sports, especially if you're not if you haven't worked in sports before. Just the the ups and downs and the highs and lows. You, I mean, you're not running a team account, which uh, is definitely that roller coaster. But you do get to see the uh, you know the highs and lows of big big events and you know with stacks of big sports events coming up. Um, you know, it's a, it is a lot of fun, but it just just because it's you're getting to watch sports all the time, it doesn't mean it's all uh, it's all fun all the time. There's a lot of hard work that goes in. That's in, that's part of it. Without a doubt, you know, you, I, I, as you know, Sean, it's no two days are the same, um, and you can get some. And whilst whilst the sports large and enjoyable, you can get some pretty uh, stressful ones. Thus, it needs to be someone who's you know pretty high octane uh, kind of problem solver really is what we're looking at within there um, that that you know can 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 work on multiple things at once but you know is comfortable when ultimately your day falls apart because several things at the last minute change or or, or news breaks uh, within our area and how much is how much is that role? becoming more of a almost a, a finder for editorial we're seeing you know we're seeing things break and and happen on whether it be Twitter or, or Facebook we saw Derek Jeter announce his retirement on Facebook just a couple of weeks ago how much you know because some of especially from a digital point of view and getting that content out and to a certain degree you know Fox Sports competes with a bunch of my clients in the sports space because you're all trying to you know outbreak each other how yeah. much how much is that social media manager like? Hang on, guys. Stop everything. You know, stop the presses. If it, if we're still doing that type of thing, to say this story's breaking, we've got to be the first to put up a put up an article and put up a gallery and 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 get that news article yeah, out because it. because it's that's how you get the that's how you get that traffic. Absolutely. Look, uh, what I would say in that is that it's not that person's specific role to be doing that all the time because they can't. You know, I, I unfortunately there. You know, well, actually, I should say, fortunately, I wouldn't want to work with a robot. But uh, you know, they can't be sitting there 24 by 7 looking at it across every single sport. There's just too much content. So we've got a big editorial team downstairs. You know, we've got a we've got some very very smart uh, and fantastic uh, TV broadcast producers who 
create great television, but they also are, you know, right into their social too. So it's about how they work with those guys to make them aware of what's going on. Now, how they do that is really within the technology and the process side of things. So it's from a basic thing about getting someone making sure if they're not already set up, that they are set up and they've got their Twitter lists in the right way and maybe they're going above and beyond Twitter lists and we're starting to pull from multiple different channels into a single kind of thread that they can be looking at. Uh, then we start to break those out in between verified accounts and then what the general kind of public is also saying and how news is moving um, so it's about really kind of help for the social media manager it's about how do you make all of those guys more efficient and get them using the tools in a better way because then that way when something breaks you know it is the NRL lead who has seen this thing come out and he's suddenly very quickly getting his team swinging towards it um, for the right outcome as opposed to the social media manager was in a meeting for an hour and, you know, and and oops, you've missed, missed it. You've missed it, exactly, yeah, exactly. right. Well, thank you very much, uh, Chris, for joining me. And as I said, um, please hit up Chris via LinkedIn or hit him up on the Twitter uh, if you are interested in the role. Um, if I hear of anybody looking for a role, I'll definitely uh, pass them on. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Cheers. Thanks, yeah, Sean. Sign up for Sports Geek News at sportsgeekhq.com slash sign up now. Thanks again to Chris Gross. Um, he's still looking for that social media manager. We had that chat earlier in the week. Uh, send him a tweet at the Chris Gross or connect with him on LinkedIn uh, asking him about that role in Sydney. Um because I've got the two interviews, it's really action-packed episode today. Uh, now I'm going to jump into my discussion with John Manning from Pricing Profits on pricing and sports and where it all fits. Uh, very happy to welcome pricing expert John Manning to the podcast. Welcome to the Sports Geek Podcast, John. Thanks, Sean. It's, uh, I feel like I haven't left the place. Yes. So if you haven't uh, listened, actually had John on the Beers, Blokes and Business podcast. So if you really want to get into pricing, we have a really good discussion with John on that. But I wanted to get John back for the Sports Geek podcast to sort of look at pricing from a sports point of view. Um, so first of all, you know, John, give us a bit of background of, of, of yourself and how you sort of came into the space of being a pricing expert. Sure. I, uh, I guess I started off my career in the oil industry, pricing petroleum products. Um, Still couldn't figure out where those prices came from, so <laughs> moved into um, pricing catering for an airline in Australia that's now defunct. That was all cost plus, so that wasn't really very exciting. Then moved into pricing the airfares, which was uh, a little bit more exciting, but still the prices were a bit like the oil industry, coming out of a bit of a, a black box. But, um, but the airline industry, I guess, is probably the one that's best known for, you know, what is a buzz term now, this dynamic uh, dynamic pricing? Absolutely. And I think, you know, the, the, um, the airlines have broken ground for a lot of industries, whether it's dynamic pricing, whether it's packaging and bundling with accommodation and things like that, and their loyalty programs as well. So... You know, so many, so many industries. Um, you know, are looking at you know how did the airline industry develop yep. their their frequent flyer programs? And there, are, you know, there are examples of frequent flyer programs that are more valuable than the airlines that run them. Yeah, yeah. So we had uh, the guys. Uh, we, I spoke to Larry from Store Financial on Ep Thirty One, and he comes from a retail background. And the same thing. You know, the fact that they've been doing loyalty for so long, yeah. it's something now that sports are starting to catch up on as far as the, the data capture point of view, but then also, you know, understanding their, understanding their fans. So what I wanted to talk to you about is, I guess, trying to get a better better grip on, for all the listeners, on the different types of pricing models that currently sports are pretty much rolling out now around membership or season ticket holders um, to, you know, to pitch those packages, um, and then also single, single game tickets. So two of the terms, and, you know, in episode 21, we sort of, I sort of spoke about what the Clippers were doing in educating their fans because part of you know pricing is is education, and they spoke Absolutely. about variable pricing and dynamic pricing. So, do you want to just sort of take us through what your definitions of those two would be? Well, I think you can you can even put an umbrella over the the, the, um, the all of the pricing models in the sports business, and it's all about segmentation. So you have you have different types of members or fans. 
um, your members, you can sell subscription models and then with or, or season tickets. And yep. within those, there are different categories of, of subscriptions and you, depending on where you're, where you're sitting, what other value adds might be offered in part of those subscriptions. And, you know, we spoke about it the other day, the bronze, silver and gold. Yep. Um, you know, they're, they're all legitimate sort of models for the, the membership um, options. With the sort of game day stuff, what we're increasingly seeing, and it's probably being driven by the US and the, yep. a lot of the sports clubs there, is to actually try and um, to price their, their seats more dynamically, taking into account an incredibly wide range of factors, including you know who's in the team, who's out of the team, where the opposition is on the on the league in the ladder and so forth, what big names are in the side, um, as well as the other factors like where the seat is in the stadium. And historical sales and, and yeah, historical you know, sales. team rivalry, that kind of thing. Absolutely. So, so is that and so how much do you think has the pricing market in sports developed um, over the past ten years with the advent of things like StubHub, you know, setting up that secondary secondary market so you can really monitor that supply and demand? I think that you know that those those platforms that allow the secondary market have been a, maybe a bit of a wake up call for the teams to say um, you know people are valuing certain tickets, certain um, passes, whatever the case may be, at a value higher than what you're putting on it. Um, and you know, in simple terms, that's leaving money on the table. Um, so. I, said, I think some of the clubs have gone, some of the teams have gone, well, I can do StubHub myself or I can develop my own sort of secondary market option. And we've seen clubs in Australia do that. Um, but I think, you know, when StubHub first emerged was a really interesting model that I kept my eyes on. Um, it, it, was, it, was a bad, it was a bad name for, you know, the, the incumbents in the industry and so forth. And they've now sort of trans, transformed themselves into a legitimate... Uh, force within the business that in the industry that provides value. Yeah, I mean, you know, we've seen now that you know the NBA have got their own their own ticketing site for their own reseller reseller platform mm-hmm. to sort of bring it in bring it in house. Um, so, how do you, you know back to the education side? And you know, if I put my fan hat on, um, you know, how do you go about explaining to the fan that you know the game on a Tuesday night versus a low performing team? you can get at a certain price but then you know when the star comes to town you have to pay an, another price weighing that against the the season ticket holder like you don't want to be showing your season ticket holder that they could have got those seats in a discount so there's that you know how much you know deeply discounted those lower or end ones are whether you can trim the fat or you know yeah. really recoup the costs on those marquee games yeah Absolutely, and I think you know you, you just mentioned cost. I think that's one thing that clubs don't necessarily want to talk about um, because you know as we spoke in the other podcast, companies don't people don't care about costs. They care about the, the value they are they are getting. Um, let's not forget that where the airlines are today took them forty years to get to. You know, it, it came about from the deregulation of the the airline industry in the US around nineteen seventy eight and. It's it's you know it hasn't taken forty years, but you know sometime after that, people started to accept that prices would fluctuate according to um, you know demand and supply and things like that. And the airlines have been really successful in building fences that differentiate the price of a cheap ticket to the price of a more expensive ticket. And often it's around things like refundability, advanced purchase, and so forth. So it's some of those things which I call fences between the different. Um, different inventory at different prices that the that the clubs need to start emphasising to to their to their members and their fans and so forth to to build that rationale for the difference in the price as well as some of the physical factors. You know, airlines have physical and non-physical f- fences, if you like. So the non-physical fences are things like the advanced purchase and refundability and so forth. The physical fences are the part of the aircraft you're sitting in. You're sitting at the pointy end or you're sitting down the back end and so forth. So they need to look at both those physical and non-physical features. So from a um, to separate the variable pricing from the dy- dynamic pricing, what's the, you know, what's the difference between those two? Like we sort of saw the NRL do variable pricing um, with some of their state of origin 
um, over the last couple of years? I think it, it's it's probably just the, the magnitude of the dynamism. You know, one of the things that grates for me a little bit about pricing is there's actually no dictionary of pricing. And what some people may call that variable pricing, others would call dynamic pricing. But I think it's just the the, the magnitude, the you know, the continuum. So what the NRL did a couple of years ago was price state of origin seats here in Australia at three tiers. You know, so if you book by such and such time, you got one price, and then it went up and so forth. Um, but that you know that could transform into you know more dynamic pricing according to the the section. So traditionally, I mean, again, traditionally that would be. It's variable, so it's like if you buy by this date, it's this, you know, and puts that time sensitive pressure on the person to buy yeah. the ticket, yeah. and then as it gets closer, you end up paying full full retail. Absolutely. But but what they could do in the future is potentially once they hit that full retail, if the demand keeps coming, that nut that full retail price could fluctuate, and that would be more you know in tune with what most people would call dynamic pricing to say, well, the demand is higher. Um, this is now what the price of, of that ticket is. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, we, we've, we've spoken about this off air. Um, there's also questions about whether ticketing platforms can, can are built for that sort of thing, uh, whether the, the stadiums want to do it. You know, some stadiums are in public hands and don't necessarily want to go down that path. Others in private hands and they're good candidates for doing that sort of stuff. And so, you know, I guess one of the key things, you know, when you're looking at, figuring out how to, how to price, what kind of data factors are some of the key ones that you look at from a, from a sports point of view, or from any point of view, but from a sports point of view that, that, that start telling you where you can adjust these prices? So I think it's, it's, it's starting to become very technology heavy now. And with that technology comes algorithms and so forth. So there are, particularly in the US, there are a couple of platforms that, um, that have these algorithms that start, um, that use a lot of historical data. Um, they're, they're sort of slightly different from other software platforms that are out in the marketplace because um, they, because of the membership structure, they, it, it's not as commercial um, as the, the more commercial type businesses, you know, extracting money from passengers for airfares and so forth is a different strategy from extracting um, people money from people who are lifetime members. Yep. So that that's certainly one factor. Um, and some of those other factors you mentioned before, you know, the historical sales, um, all, all that sort of stuff, the weather, um, and also, you know, the, the, the match record last season, the season before, and so forth. And it is, I mean, it is partly also understanding who your fans are. It comes I back mean, to that segmentation. Because, I mean, I know... From an AFL uh, point of view, uh, Collingwood was one of the, the first teams to move from the uh, full season ticket member. So uh, in Australia, a full season ticket member would be either an 18 game for all games or an 11 game for a home, home games. games only. Um, and they went to and surveyed their fans to see how many fans couldn't go to 11 games and that's why they hadn't signed up. And their data came back and said there would be fans who were willing to going to some games who just wanted to support the club. So they modified their membership product, and I guess this is a packaging strategy from a pricing point of view, to offer that three-game membership. Um, and then there were a few clubs that followed, followed, suit, followed, followed suit, but probably didn't do the same amount of research and saw some of their, some of their memberships, um, membership categories... Cannibalised. Cannibalised and, and downgraded rather than filling up that new new segment so it is as much you know knowing knowing Absol- your knowing absolutely. your fan and knowing the i guess the value proposition of your fan so if you've got a fan that's really hard on uh you know the value proposition they might be interested in that smaller package or they might be interested in that variable tuesday night they're a cheaper ticket type of one because that's their key value proposition absolutely and i always say that the the single point of failure in pricing is the, the customer or the member. If you don't get it right, they're just not going to buy or they're going to you know, downgrade from the 11 game to the three game plan. Okay. And so I guess one of the things, you know, looking at from, you know, looking at the US uh, and the UK to, to Australia, um, one of the things, you know, and I've, you know, I've bought tickets on StubHub and I've spoken to guys 
that are you know using dynamic ticketing strategies in the US and it's still developing here in Australia. What do you think are the factors in in why that hasn't sort of kicked on here in in Australia just yet? So there's probably a couple of things I've already mentioned. You know, the, the, who owns the venues and so forth, um, and the, the the degree of technical capabilities in the in the ticketing platforms and so forth. But I would think that you know there's a there's probably a third one, and that's around the appetite for risk. Um, and you know, we, I, I see a lot of companies, particularly outside of sport, that are reluctant to change their approach to pricing because they think it's all or nothing. It's it's big bang. But they don't have to do that. You know, one of the one of the great ways would be to experiment with differential pricing in the NAB Cup, for example. You know, the pre-season competition or. Um, probably not so much in the FA Cup in the UK because that's such a big competition and a, and a fantastic competition. But, you know, picking some of those, um, you know, those less important games and and trying something there. Yep. I remember a couple of years back, we were both at a, um, at a networking event where there was a, someone from Collingwood talking. Yep. And I asked a question because that was the year the Gold Coast Suns were joining the competition and yep. my team were playing them the following weekend and I asked him why why should I have to pay anything at all when you know my team who was at the top of the la- towards the top of the ladder at that time were playing the team that was on the bottom um, and he, I, he didn't really have a good answer for me for that and yeah in that game we kicked a record first quarter score in you know in the in the first 20 minutes um, and it's a, but it is a matter of the I guess the quality of the opposition and that's Absolutely. your proposal to say it wasn't of that much of a value but their systems weren't in place that's to right. be able to offer that's a different right. a and, different price and it was an interstate team playing a Melbourne team so the stadium was never going to be full so you know things like you know bring a friend or kids get in for free but again, and stuff the, like the, that. I mean part of it is like you said the, the, the stadium deals that are currently in place that are quite restrictive and they were signed yeah. years before any of these pricing deals come in I think the other thing from an Australian to a US comparison is I guess just the, the volume of Size games the market uh, yeah. And that, you know the fact that there is, you know, for an NBA, there's 80, 82 or forty one home games, so there's a lot of tickets available. Absolutely. Baseball is a you know classic example that does a lot with you know the the amount of games that they have. So there's always, you know, options available. Whereas um, you know the other thing, uh, from an Australian point of view, we've got these, you know, big stadiums uh, that that you know that they're not, they're not full. So there's not that super demand. Yeah, which um, means that on top of all those variables like the weather, the players and so forth, you've got these two economic things called demand and supply. Yeah, and, and, and at the, the moment we have, you know, they have the MCG down the road and it, and it seats 100,000 and by and large most weeks you can walk up and get a yeah, ticket. So, so it's Absolutely. a cultural thing of I know I can walk and get a ticket. Now there's, you know, they're moving towards more fully ticketed games and I think as that continues to grow then the options of how you get that ticket um, we saw at the Australian Open had their own ticket marketplace uh, this year as a way to oh, you've bought a ticket and you want to put it back on yeah. uh, have it as that secondary market but um, yeah I still think it's a it's primarily an education thing I mean currently we are seeing the AFL proposing to look at blockbuster tax for some of the you know and that's how it's been phrased in the you know that might be more media you know, referring to it as you know, blockbuster tax and it's not going to be well received by fans if that's how it gets pitched. If that comes back to that, commu- how do we communicate this to members and so forth? You don't go and communicate it as a tax. So, yeah. the, you know, you actually might start with the education of the media. Um, it was interesting. I went to the uh, the T20 game at the um, the MCG last Friday night, England versus Australia or Australia versus England. And sort of going through the, the barriers at the, at the MCG, it sort of struck me that there's been a lot of investment made in producing the tickets and, and scanning the you know the scanning technology to get in there but not necessarily a lot in you know what's what people are being paid to you know to, to go through those turnstiles and so forth and one thing we haven't talked about which you know we spoke a lot um, I'm sure um, Troy Kirby is listening and we talked yep. a fair bit about that in his sports tower um, where Podcast, Google yeah. hangout a couple of months ago was this idea of bundling up um, you know, a hot dog, a drink, a soda, whatever the case may be, with some of those tickets. You know, I took my son in, and you know, we we grabbed chips and 
and, and again and, and drink and, and so forth and so yes but and again that pricing and packaging are pretty much in, interlinked you know so it's not just you're not just getting it it allows you to attract the value you know the value based customer of seeing oh I get a ticket and, a, and four hot dogs and four Abs- cokes and absolutely and, and how easy would it be to scan that barcode at the at the at the bar or the well yeah and the stadiums are getting up to speed with that but the problem is from an Australian point of view at least that concessions the, within the, the stadium concessions within the stadium are a stadium deal and they're not tied to the venue hire and stuff yeah. like that so that's, that's the other thing from a ticketing point of view that the US teams have an advantage on is that they can package up that uh, thing I think I was listening on Troy's podcast uh, uh, Steve DeLay talking about you know having a ticket that had an all you can eat yeah you know and you can eat as many hot dogs as you can and they you know they sold out that block with that specific ticket so um, you know that's another strategy another strategy is you know pricing options that you've got around around group ticketing and and what you can offer from a from a group point of view so I guess price. I guess my main thing, and you know, several discussions I've had with you, is that pricing's not one. It's not one thing. It's not just the dollar it's not figure. Just the at the dollar's bottom. more holistic than that. Yeah. And you know, you go from there. You from the from the hot dogs and the sodas and so forth. You then start to think about the merchandising, and then you can even think about your international, your interstate supporter base. And you know, can you can you assist them with accommodation and so forth, and you know, make their trip. You know, to to see a game and a team on an away game, even more special, some way or another. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for joining me on the podcast. I will link to you at Pricing Profits, your Sand Pre on Twitter, which will be linked in the show notes, and also link to the other podcast you've done with Troy. But thanks for coming on. Pleasure. Learn from Sports Geek at our Sports Geek ODE One Day Educational. Go to sportsgeekhq.com/slash ODE. Thanks again to John Manning from Pricing Profits for joining me in at uh, Sports Geek HQ. Apologies for a little bit of the background noise. Uh, I share my offices with other creatives and it is a photography studio, so sometimes the studio is booked and it does take a lot of noise to make uh, to take a few photos, especially when there's kids involved. So I hope that wasn't too distracting. Um, as DJ Joel said there, in the little in the little bumper, uh, Sports Geek ODE, uh, the one day educational. Just a quick take on the cricketing one day international. Um, it's a one day workshop we're hosting at Honey Bar on March 31st. So if you want to come along, if you want a refresher in all things social, digital, and how you're using all the platforms, more than welcome to see uh, plenty of sports teams there. It's really a broader workshop. So if you know someone who's struggling with their social presence, trying to work, get it working for their business or they or they work in, in the marketing department and don't quite understand how their business or their brand can use social, that's exactly what this uh, workshop is intended for. Um, additionally, I'll have two really smart blokes coming along, uh, Josh Rowe and Steve Sammartino. Um, I've, had, have, I've had Sam on the, on the podcast before. He's the guy behind the Lego car. Uh, so they're going to come in and we're going to have a chat with them about what they what they've done with social, what they understand um, from a digital strategy point of view, and how they've applied it in businesses that they've worked with. So simply go to sportsgeekhq.com/ode uh, to check it out. Um, and if even if you don't want to go, if there is someone you think uh, might benefit from going, I'd love it if you could share it with them. Uh, so last week's sound of the game um, was. Um, and it got a good response. It was it was a bit of silence, a bit of a stab at uh, the Olympic Organising Committee uh, for protecting their content so much and uh, not letting content go out. Uh, so I got a good response from that. I'm not going to name where this sounds came from. I'm just going to say the people cheering might be watching people wearing spandex and a lot of bedazzling. Sports Geek Sounds of the Game. And hopefully that does not get me in trouble. Um, again, if you've got a sense of the game, if you're at a game, whether it be football, uh, cricket, preseason, doesn't matter. Um, simply take your phone out, record 
a snippet and send it to me at uh, sean at sportsgeekhq.com. I'd love to include more sounds of the game. And as I start attending a few more games with footy season around the corner, I will have some myself. Um, That's about it uh, for this week's episode. I think I've covered off everything. Social media post of the week. Thank you, DJ Joel. It is time for the social media post of the week. Um, And this week, I'm going to give it to the Geelong Cats, uh, Geelong Football Club, on Twitter this week. Uh, Their their stadium, uh, known as the Cattery, or Skilled Stadium, I think it's called at the moment, uh, was hosting St Kilda versus the Western Bulldogs in a pre-season game. And there was a flash flood, and the whole stadium was uh, pretty much flooded just before the game was about to get started. And the Cats quite cheekily sent out a tweet saying, it's the last time we loan out the category, you won't be getting your bond back, Western Bulldogs and St Kilda. St Kilda were quick with a reply saying, no issues with us, we'll stick to the joint. With the roof from now on, thank you very much. Uh, as they play at Etihad Stadium and they never have to play in rain because they've got a roof on the on top of the stadium. Uh, but uh, Geelong Cats and a shout out to Tom Peters who drives uh, the Geelong Twitter account very quick with the reply, if only the 09 grand final was under a roof, hey. Just sort of giving it to the St Kilda faithful uh, who lost uh, that close grand final in 2009. So kudos to the Geelong Cats on Twitter there. Nice bit of by play uh, for the fans. Uh, that is the wind up clock that tells me to get to dedicate this episode and get out uh, because this one has run long. And apologies if you're running and waiting for the end of the episode. I'll get out. Uh, this episode 39, you can find the show notes at sportsgeekhq.com slash 39. Um, I did put out nominations to Twitter, um, but there's only one person I thought I could nominate this to, and that would be the Wiz, Warwick Kappa, 80s AFL or VFL on that stage, uh, football star, was the pride of Sydney town. Um, I'll include a YouTube clip of Warwick Kappa in his short shorts and high-flying marks. Um, He's still bobbing up trying to keep his name in the news, but I'm going to dedicate this episode to Warwick Kappa, and who knows... He might uh, retweet this episode if he's on Twitter. Um, that's it for this week's show. Um, again, one final plug from, you know, you can connect with all the guests, including Chris and John from this episode. Thanks, guys. You simply go to sportsgeekhq.com slash SGP episodes or SGP guests uh, to get a list of the episodes and the guests. That's right, DJ Joel. It's time for the closing two cents. And it sort of comes from our discussion last week with Daniel McLaren on hashtags. Had a bit of traction with that with a few people. So I thought I'd use it as my closing two cents. Now, there's no right way to tweet. um, But here is my take on sports business hashtags. Uh, Sports biz is for all things sports business. Digisport is for all things in the sports digital space, content, activations, engagement, social media, And then SM Sports is specifically for activations and contents on social media. There's no right way, but that's my way. Hashtag just saying. Cheers. Please leave a review on iTunes. Go to sportsgeekhq.com slash iTunes. Find all Sports Geek podcasts at sportsgeekhq.com slash SGP. Want to maximize returns from your digital team? Contact Sports Geek about content and commercialization workshop. Thanks for listening to the Sports Geek Podcast.